Hey, everybody. I don't know if you've heard this yet or not, but the plague is back. No, not the plague that we're currently all dealing with, which is not actually a plague, but I know a lot of people, myself included, have been referring to it like that. And I should probably stop doing that, honestly, because while it is kind of funny and it gets across the idea that this is a very fucked up thing that is happening, uh, it is scientifically inaccurate because COVID-19 is caused by a coronavirus and a virus is a very different beast from uh, a bacterium, which is what causes the plague. So you got that? COVID-19, not the plague. So I got your attention now. The plague is back. A herder in China caught the plague. Oh no, this is a very big deal because, well, because it's hot right now to talk about China like it's a disease incubator. Ah, racism. The plague is not actually a big deal. Uh, here's why. The plague is caused by a bacterium known as Yersinia pestis, which comes from the same Latin root from which we get pestilence. Not a coincidence. Uh, it infects rats, humans, and a variety of other mammals, many other mammals. Uh, fleas, which enjoy chomping on rats, humans, and many other mammals, are carriers of Y. pestis. They're like the asymptomatic carriers of COVID-19, uh, where they're not bothered by it, but they can spread it. The plague can take three different forms. Uh, one is septicemic, which is where uh, it's the rarest type, and it's where the plague infects your blood. There's pneumonic, which, as you might guess from the name, is where the plague infects your lungs. And then there's bubonic, which is the one you've most likely heard of. That's where it infects your lymph nodes, causing them to swell and burst and become necrotic. It's pretty disgusting. Here's a brief aside about that. A few years back, I was looking around for a new audiobook to listen to while I walk, and I stumbled across Connie Willis's To Say Nothing of the Dog, which I found to be a delightful romp. It's about time-traveling historians who accidentally screw up history and need to put things right again in the Victorian era. I absolutely loved it, and a short time later a friend asked me to recommend a fun, breezy science fiction read, and I told her she should definitely check out To Say Nothing of the Dog. And she did, and she texted me back saying that she looked it up, and she, before she was about to buy it, she noticed that it's actually a sequel, and she wanted to know if she should read the first book in the series before she starts on that. And I was shocked, because I had no idea that it was a series. Uh, but I said, you know, you don't need to, but you might as well uh, pick up the first book. And so as she did, I did as well. The first book in the series is called Doomsday Book. Within a few days, I, I hadn't got around to reading it yet, but my friend contacted me and she was absolutely furious because Doomsday Book, as the title might suggest to you, was not a delightful romp. Uh, while it is in the same universe and it features time-traveling historians, it is essentially the story of a woman who travels back to the Middle Ages and accidentally ends up in a village that is just about to be hit with the Black Death, the plague. Um, at which point, all she can really do is watch the people around her die horrible, painful deaths. Uh, obviously, there's more to the story, and I still highly recommend you give it a read. Um, if for some reason you too are currently interested in the spread of deadly epidemics, but just know before you go in that it is not a delightful romp in any way, but it does give a really great, really disgusting up close and personal look at what it's like to contract and die from the bubonic plague. And it's terrifying. Uh, essentially, bubonic plague starts out with you feeling kind of like you have a cold. Uh, aches, nausea, malaise, vomiting. And then within a few days to a week, the bacteria flare up in your lymph nodes and uh, that causes what's known as buboes, which is where we get bubonic, uh, big pus-filled globes that appear in your armpits, your groin, your neck. Uh, back in the 14th century, it killed about 80% of everyone who contracted it. 
And that was just for the bubonic form. Uh, you can get any of the three forms from any of the other forms. Um, so somebody with the bubonic plague could spread it to someone and they could get it in their lungs. And now it's pneumonic plague. Uh, pneumonic plague had a mortality rate of 90 to 95%. Um, and septicemic, where it infects your blood, at that point, you're just dead, 100% dead. Nobody knows exactly how many people have died from the plague, uh, but numbers range from 25 to 200 million just for the Black Death of the 14th century. There were also another 25 to 100 million people killed as part of the earlier outbreak known as the Justinian Plague in the 6th century. So, that's all pretty fucking serious, right? Up to 200 million deaths is nothing to sneeze at even today. But imagine at a time when the entire world population was only like twice that. Imagine if nearly 4 billion people died this year from a disease. It's terrifying. So now maybe thanks to this news, you know that we never really got rid of the plague. Why pesties is still out there infecting humans like this poor herder in Mongolia. But here's why you don't actually have to be scared of the plague unless you're a time traveling historian. It's a little thing called antibiotics. Uh, that's right, Y. pestis is a bacterium, uh, which means that unlike a virus, we actually have a weapon that can kill it outright. If caught early, uh, like within 24 hours of the first symptoms appearing, a treatment of antibiotics reduces mortality to somewhere between 1 and 15 percent. And we know all of this because this is not, in fact, a newsworthy event. Thousands of people get the plague every year, including here in the United States, where people contract it from infected rodents, usually in the Southwest. Two people near Denver, Colorado, died from it in 2015, thanks to infected prairie dogs. On average, seven Americans contract the bubonic plague every year. A handful of countries have persistent outbreaks, uh, including the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Peru, and if you can believe it, Madagascar. That's right, the country that is infamous to players of a game called Plague Inc. for being nearly impossible to infect with the plague actually has the plague all the time. It's still serious, you know, if you are in a far-flung part of the world where there's a risk of you contracting bubonic plague, like, say, Denver, Colorado, you should absolutely be aware of the symptoms and seek treatment immediately, even if you're in a country with poor access to affordable health care, like Denver, Colorado. If untreated, the mortality rate is about 50% uh, these days, better than in the Middle Ages, but it's still not worth betting your life on a coin flip. But don't be concerned upon hearing that a herder in Mongolia contracted bubonic plague from a marmot. He's being treated. The locals know what symptoms to watch out for because this has happened before. And you are much, much more likely to contract, spread, or die from COVID-19 or influenza. So please stay home or wear a mask if you have to go out. And, you know, if you're staying home most of the time anyway you're probably not going to come into contact with any infected marmots. So you're safe from the plague.